This podcast contains some magical adult language. Listener discretion is advised. And sorry, Mom. Night was falling, and the lamplighters were plying their trade. Hey, 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 light the lamp, not the rat, light the lamp, not the rat! Welcome to Rat Castle, a progressive chat about Disney magic without the pixie dust. I'm Nathan Hartman, and with me today are some wonderful, jubilant, um, I, not ghosts from Christmas present, but they're, they are the rats of Christmas present. Uh, we have uh, several with us today. Uh, Saru is gone. Uh, she uh, was gifted Billie Eilish tickets from Santa, so she's out. Um, but we have Janine. Hello, Janine. Hello, I made it. You did make it. You are, <laughs> you are in the midst of German and all sorts of business and it's finals life. week, baby. Yeah, and birthday yeah. and Christmas and you know it's much easier when you're on the teaching end of finals week. Generally oh yeah, speaking. I can imagine. So yeah, you don't have to study to grade. No, it's much easier. Uh, and yeah. Victoria, welcome, Victoria. Hello, I'm I've returned. <laughs> you look so sleepy there. Uh, oh, she was... No, there's there's oil in my oh, there's, eye there's oil in your eye <laughs> like um, from my hair i just i thought it might i thought it might be uh sleepy dust or something you just looked a little tired um but yeah you just got your hair done so welcome thank you everyone's like making it work and i appreciate that thank you um <laughs> laura mighty dave yo hi dave how are you dave I am glamorous. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Thank you. We're all doing so well in this chaotic season. <laughs> and a very special guest is joining us, a uh, the film reviews editor for The Wrap, author of the excellent Have Yourself a Movie Little Christmas, and a decades-long friend of Dave's. It's Alonzo Duralde. Thank you so much for coming. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Woo! Ba -ba -ba -ba. Yeah. Uh, it's weird how this all kind of comes about. I have been listening, Alonzo, to your podcast, Linoleum Knife, and then Who Shot You Before That?, um gosh for years now and dave and i connected to do this podcast and you were one of his twitter friends and i was like do you know alonzo and he was like i i know alonzo and i was dave like cobb knows everybody <laughs> i think we need to make this very clear they, dave dave cobb is the juncture of the universe that just all <laughs> wheels pass through just say it just say it i'm a whore just say yeah. it well yeah. no our joke was always he's not a social butterfly he's a social mothra <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I've been in those parties with Dave at this point, and uh, he he does sort of jump table to table uh, like they're lamps. Um, he makes it work. I'll take it. Now I have well, I have in front of me, of course. Uh, have yourself a movie, Little Christmas, which has oh, been read you. recently, and uh, you have signed it. Actually, it's to Larry, but you signed it, so there you go. <laughs> Larry, I'll get you for that. <laughs> yeah. I got it, but Larry took away. But anyway, a lovely book. Thank you. Um, but what's interesting is if you read the beginning uh, material, the thanks, as it were, Dave, you show up. Why do you show up in this book? I gave him the title. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I did nothing. I did absolutely nothing. I, you know, I think he was just looking for titles from friends, and I went, how about this? So... I did a lunchtime poll on uh, Facebook and Cobb won. There you go. <laughs> Woo, I won. I won. I won. That's all I won. So where did you two meet? Uh, we met actually at a friend's comedy show. I'm pretty yes. sure, right? Yeah. I believe like the Ha Ha Hut or something the in Hush. North Hollywood. Something like that. Yeah, the Ha Ha Hut. Um, yeah, it was Bob Koenig's show, wasn't it? It was like- uh, Yes, like his very first uh, his very first outing as a stand-up. And we, were, we both knew him separately and we were both being supportive and we just started chatting. Yeah, our friend Bob Lou, who is now, now an announcer for uh, a pro wrestling circuit, strangely enough. That works. Um, yeah, it, it totally fits. <laughs> And if you know him, it totally fits. Absolutely fits. Um, so yeah, they were at the table next to us, and and uh, we started chatting, and and uh, we've been friends for over over twenty years now. Yes, Aww. twenty years. Ah. What? Can you believe it? Um, we brought Alonzo on, of course, because of Christmas time, uh, the Christmas zaddy, as he is known in, in certain <laughs> circles. But of course, Dave, you were like ecstatic about it because you have done Christmas trips with Alonzo to the theme parks. Yes. What do you love about the theme parks at Christmas, Dave and Alonzo? Well, let me let me first say that so uh, Alonzo and his lovely husband Dave 
are the furthest from theme park fans you could True. possibly get. Yeah. Um, they are not theme park people. We're not haters, though. They're not haters. No, they're not haters. It's just that it's not their thing, right? Yeah. Um, but <laughs> Christmas is Alonzo's thing, like a thousand and, percent. And Dave's. And Dave, right. Both yeah. of them just love Christmas. And so I forget it was probably early aughts. You were like, hey, I heard Disneyland does really great Christmas stuff. And I'm like, it's time. <laughs> and so <laughs> for like for like six, we almost probably a decade, I guess. Yeah, a good chunk of it. Yeah. Good chunk of it. Every year I would pick some midweek day to take off work and we'd go when the crowds weren't insane and go um, sort of marinate in Christmas. As, as Alonzo used to call it, like, um, it's like mainlining Christmas into your eyeballs, you know, put right it in, in my veins, put it in my veins, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we, you know, and it was really just there for the Christmas stuff. We would do some of the other rides, but it was mainly about uh, Small World Holiday and uh, Nightmare Before Christmas uh, Holiday and mm. the food and drink, and that was about it. And we watched the Christmas parade, and it would snow, and uh, Alonzo would tear up, and we'd go home. Like it was. Uh, I I, I love those trips. Yeah. What was your favorite stuff though, Alonzo? What was it, like? What were your huh. favorite sort of discoveries of those trips that you didn't know? Uh well, let's see. Um, you know, uh, the year that California Adventure did that big sort of Christmas menu, where there was like booth after booth after booth, and they had different like holiday little yummies and boozes and stuff. Like that was great. I remember just like crawling our way through that and just trying all this stuff it was really delicious <laughs> soused by the time we were done yeah <laughs> basically um you know uh, uh, on, on that note the carthay circle i think is like you know such a great play you know it, it's it's just such a nice because after a day in the park and the kids and the whole uh, you want to sit down mm -hmm. you want to sit down <laughs> where there's like a cloth tablecloth and like really good cocktails and like really good food and and so i it just i thought oh my god where is where has this been my entire life of going to like amusement parks as a kid so yeah that was great when they when they really when they trotted out the whole um the color of the world of colors that was called yeah. the big mm -hmm. light yeah. show on the water with the the christmas stuff like that was right up there with the fireworks as being like just punching you in the fields until you you know surrender <laughs> <laughs> but you know I, I you know i just i like the idea that you could work in like space mountain and ornaments bigger than your head you know on main <laughs> street and like a, a handbell choir appears out of nowhere under a bridge like okay i'm here for all of this <laughs> yeah I, I i actually went through all of my eye photos and looked for the photos that we took over the years. And I think my favorite ones were when Bugs Land was still around, which is no longer there. It's mm. Avengers Campus now. But um, they decorated that in a really clever way. There were these giant, uh, uh, the big outdoor Christmas lights, the bigger bulbs. Mm. Imagine giant versions of those. And they were sort of hanging overhead like a canopy. And then there were these huge, round, shiny Christmas balls that you could stand next to. And I and, and then that I I think that was what our Christmas card one year. We, we took a picture in front of that. But um but yeah, I mean that I have such great memories of that, mainly because of the ongoing commentary of this sacred ground of attractions and place for me mm -hmm. to Dave and Alonzo. It's this completely other cultural thing. And you're in there ongoing British, not like again, they're not haters. I don't mean to make it sound like it wasn't MST3K. <laughs> right. They weren't making fun of it at all. No. But it was these little bon mots they would throw into it that was like, oh, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. You know? You, what you're talking about is truth and reality. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. 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 Yeah. Basically, not in the fantasy of Disneyland that is in my head, but in the reality of what's in front of you that I choose to ignore. My favorite was always uh, uh, um, a small little holiday with you guys, just because oh. it's so crazy over the top. Yeah, like I mean, just I mean, the the ride itself is is bananas in the best way, in a way that I won't don't necessarily like the un you know uh, sure. uh, holiday. Uh, it's a small world, but man, when the when that clock goes off every fifteen minutes, and just all of the the way that it is lit up at that time of year, it's it, it's like suck it lawn displays. You'll never be this. You know? <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. Right, and I love that the final room where all the colors of the world meld together to become basically white. Um. <laughs> well, you know, the, 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 the old adage is, is, and I heard this because I was on the ride and someone behind me said, you know, they're all dead at the end, right? Like, that's the idea. <laughs> this is heaven. 
<laughs> and I've never been able to like that's never left my head every time I'm like these are all these are dead children they've all died so. <laughs> that is now in my head canon for the rest of my life yeah literally yeah, every great. day I yeah. fight for my spot for heaven every time I get on this podcast <laughs> <laughs> the thing about small world is it's this close just to being the Santa Claus movie uh, the old Mexican Santa Claus movie, like <laughs> you just need the the big nosed or the, the with the with the lips, uh, and everyone's Santa singing Claus, a little song, right? Isn't that yeah? Yeah, mm -hmm. the 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 big mouth in the wall that, that mm -hmm. says yeah. things, and the the ear on the oscillating fan that uh, hears yeah. the children. Yeah, we're what that close. Santa I mean, Klaus. it's basically what that the half of that movie is 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 just a a stereotypical trip around the world. Mary Blair never meant it to be like this. <laughs> no, it's not her fault. We never would. Dave, you wanted to uh, talk a little bit about, we don't have a lot of news tonight because we wanted to keep it yeah. really Christmassy, but we had some breaking news in your wheelhouse. And so we thought we'd talk about it real quick. And then we're going to get back into Christmas because Janine and I uh, did a little Christmas trip at, at Walt Disney World. But Dave, oh, cool. give us a little uh, a little taste of some interesting I, I don't know if it's good. It's sad, I guess, is the term people are kind of using at this point. Yeah, th this is I, I, I'm I'm actually kind of surprised. I'm not usually shocked at, at theme park news, but this sort of shocked me a little bit. No, because I know most of the people involved. Yeah. Um, and this hit right before we recorded that um, Comcast Universal, uh, uh, a bunch of high ranking executives at Universal Creative, which is Universal's Imagineers, for lack of a better term, um, are heading for the exit just a few years before the launch of their new park epic universe and it's uh evidently it's all positive they're, they're doing it at their own accord it is evidently a um uh, uh nbc universal wide initiative not just parks offered to employees who are over 57 and or who have worked at the company for more than 10 years basically that's i think uh, most of this uh, senior vps there uh, are basically mm. taking this as an exit it's weird that like the top guy Terry Koo is very well very well loved in the theme park fan community. Everybody knows him. He's a good guy, extremely talented. I didn't work with him, but I worked adjacent to him while he was doing Spider Man. So he's it was that was one of his first Universal things, and he sort of rose through the ranks during Universal's huge growth. And so, you know, I always tell people Universal was the Wild West when I worked there from ninety eight mm. to two thousand. It was not what it is now, and it is much more of a streamlined machine. And I think. My assumption, people like Terry leaving, um, people like uh, uh, um, uh, Mike Hightower, who was the president, the president of Universal Creative. He was my boss. He was he was my boss when I worked at um, uh, for, on Men in Black. So uh, uh, my assumption is that all that is happening because the machine is so well oiled and works so well. Uh, unlike you know, unlike Disney Imagineering where they really touted their yeah. um, industrial uh, uh, knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think that's as important to Universal. Um and, and that sounds crass, but it's true they don't really need that. And so I think this is a chance for them to have executives at that level that don't get paid quite as much because these guys were at the forefront of it and got to ask for the moon and got right. it and and help the place grow and that secession then they said they've they have secession plans in in place i am assuming that's so they can get a younger hungrier less expensive executive board basically i mean um, shapex available <laughs> <laughs> let's not let's not put that out in the universe i don't need to secret that yeah. um, <laughs> Dave, I you know it's when you mention that I it, you're right when it comes to industry knowledge and universal like let's not kid ourselves on the fact that it's it's shocking that Men in Black still exists. I mean, Universal is so good <laughs> at like like every 15 years yeah. just knocking things down and starting over unless Steven Spielberg's like you can't touch it. <laughs> Beyond that, the other thing is the days of where Imagineering really engineered and built everything back in the Maypo days. Yeah. And that just doesn't happen. Like the dirty little secret of the, this industry is the vendor companies that get hired do most of the innovation yeah. and most of the building and most of the engineering. So um, Universal has, Disney always kept that quiet. It was very difficult if you worked for, as a, for a, uh, if you're working as a vendor company on an Imagineering project, there were years where you could not, there was a decade or more where you couldn't talk about it at all. Universal went the other direction and said, no, 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 no. We're hiring the smartest people in, you know, engineering and special effects and coaster design and whoever, and they'll work under our purview and we'll direct them to 
do something that they haven't done anywhere else. And that's how we get our innovation. But they, but because of that, I think it just, it's, it's setting the machine up to work a little leaner. Mm. Um, the, the, okay. the, I think the, 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 the crass, the sort of cynical view of it is that they're slimming down like that for yet another merger of some sort. You know, people are like, will Warner Discovery buy them or whatever? I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think Comcast wants that. Um, but who knows? We'll have yet another mega conglomerate. Shineheart wigs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, probably the Six Sigma uh, policy. <laughs> um, but yeah, I well, you know, all the best to them. I will always yeah. give credit uh um, to uh, Terry for uh, coming out and being like, "Oh yeah, Fast and Furious was a terrible idea." <laughs> he was, <laughs> yeah. He just said it, yeah. and, and everyone was like, "There was Thank no you. spin. There was never any spin with Universal executives and Universal announcements. They were really, they were really sort of, they were pretty transparent about most yeah. things. Like they often say, they often saved announcements to the last. Like everybody knew Velocicoaster was coming. <laughs> I mean, it was, it a, was not a secret. It was a but coaster they did, there. They never, <laughs> they never really officially announced it. And, and that whole, like Alonzo, there was this thing where um, the, the construction walls went up for their major attraction a couple of years ago. It was built during COVID actually called Velocicoaster and it's incredible and much lauded in the industry and really great. But the construction walls went up and Coaster Steel started going, but they hadn't announced anything. And so somebody <laughs> joked, I, was it the Universal account that joked it was for a churro stand? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> I think it was, yeah. So the official Universal account was like, oh, don't worry. Don't look, you know, nothing to see here. It's just going to be a churro stand. And the fans jumped on that and started doing like fan renderings of like the most expensive churro stand ever. And like <laughs> people bought, like they didn't buy it, but they acted like they bought it. And that's yeah. like, that's better than any spin. Like, okay, you're teasing us and you're admitting you're teasing us. That's awesome. And then didn't they like hand out churros? Yes, yeah, in the they yes, they did. <laughs> yeah, they did. When it opened, they handed out churros to everybody. Churro around. tycoon. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, and that's what's so funny is I I think it was like people had already created coaster versions in those games before they even announced the like it was all there. Uh, yeah, you and see there was it. A, yeah, so it, it's a totally different way of doing things. But I I agree. I hope that you know. I don't love shakeups, especially right now. I feel like I've had enough of them, um, but we'll see what happens. They're going so well when you look at Warner Discovery, right? <laughs> that's great, isn't it? It's great for creatives and and cinema, right? Oh, wait, sorry. I was going to put uh, uh, Westworld on my watch say. list. <laughs> oh, 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 what? Oh, wait, when I what? tell you, I literally started watching Westworld last night, and then I saw they were taking it off. And I'm like, what the <laughs> fuck is the point? What is the point? I just got three episodes in. Victoria, honestly, they saved you some time. They, to, be, to be honest, the, but the first series great, but yeah, hundred percent. The first, first, yeah, stop after the first season. Um, sorry, Westworld fans, I'm not with you on the later ones. The, <laughs> the, um, but the other thing, the other, like obviously, yeah, it sucks that they're taking it off that streaming. But the rumor is that it's because they can make more licensing it to other people, like Netflix. Oh, I don't know. I, I just heard they didn't want to pay uh, residuals. <laughs> yeah. Well, and if they license to other people, they'll probably make more money than they can pay the residuals. That I, I've heard both sides of that. So who you know who knows what they're. Thinking. I guess, but I mean the the whole idea, the, the promise of streaming was always like it's we're opening yeah. up the HBO vaults, which was always a lie. Try watching Dream On, you know, yeah. like there's a lot of <laughs> vintage stuff that they just never bothered to make available. I'm still waiting for the Boatniks on Disney Plus, but you know, right. it, it's now it's gotten to this point where it's just like we're really you know. HBO Max is the only streaming service at this point that, that has any kind of film made before 1980 in a substantial number. And, and who knows where that's, that's going to go. But it's all yeah. very depressing, which is why I've been writing a, a physical media column for years yeah. because I just do not get rid of this stuff because you cannot rely on these corporations to keep it going for you. The strange thing about HBO Max is, is you, you're right. They'll have sort of whatever is between criteria, like the Criterion Collection channel and what is owned by TCM, they kind of have that. Right. Um, and then they'll just be like, and here's everything from Turner Classic Movies. And there's just like house party in there. It's it's the weirdest. <laughs> they don't they don't like take care of that shop very well. Yeah, because I was working for Filmstruck when that mm. existed. And then they yanked it. They're like, well, no, no, it's going to be a whole section on HBO Max. I'm like, 
Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> Show me that when it happens. And it kind of, I mean, yes, they do have the criteria and stuff. They do have the TCM stuff. But yeah, there's a there's a lot of stuff under that TCM shingle where it's like, you just had this and didn't know where else to put it, right? Like, I would love to hear Ben Mankiewicz do some intros to some of those films, though. Just... Kid and play. Yeah. <laughs> just Wow. Uh, Alonzo, are there any holiday movies or or well obviously there's a ton of holiday specials that have, are gone into the ether like tv uh-huh. stuff but are there any holiday features that you know are impossible to find that you have on physical media that you love oh good question um hmm uh, actually yes i can i can name a couple uh there is so uh the the irish filmmaker bill forsyth who most famously did gregory's girl and local hero Sorry, Scottish. No, what am I saying? Not Irish. Scottish. Uh, had a movie called Comfort and Joy, which is about, it's based on a true story. It's about uh, rival uh, ice cream vendor gangs <laughs> taking each other on and this depressed DJ who sort of like negotiates a piece between them. And it's all set at Christmas time. And oh. I still have my VHS copy because it has never been released on DVD or Blu ray oh, in the US. Wow. That sounds so good. It's really fun. And Mark Knopfler did the score and it's, oh my it, God. it's, it's terrific. It kind of and sounds like Nickelodeon made it. <laughs> you would think. But would there's think. Like, there, there are there are actual mobs running these ice cream things, so it does get a touch violent. <laughs> um and then I, I have a I have a British uh DVD of this movie called Christmas Holiday, and it's a noir film. Uh, and it stars Deanna Durbin, who was like a big oh. juvenile star, you know, like yeah. Judy Garland era. This was sort of her first like adult role. She plays a singer in a whorehouse, except it's a 40s movie. So it's, you know, a cafe. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> and and like she has this, you know, she's tied up with this like insane mobster husband who's like mommy obsessed and a pathological liar and gambler and murderer played by Gene Kelly. Yeah, that's what uh, I was going to say. <laughs> it's his weird noir one that no one ever yeah, talks yeah. about. It's really Is that good. Pre-code? Well, you, it is no, no, no. It's post. It's the it's the forties. Okay. Uh, but the thing is because of some weirdness with like the Somerset mom estate, cause it's based on one of his short stories. It's you cannot get it. You can't even book it anymore. Like I actually oh. years ago at the arrow did a double feature of comfort and joy and Christmas holiday. Cause they were sort of the two movies you couldn't get. And I was talking to somebody recently. They said, yeah, you can't even book a 35 print anymore. So yeah. So if you can, if you can track either of those down, good luck. Cause uh, the, you're not going to find them on what's left of HBO max. Oh, Holy man. shit. It's real. A Scottish <laughs> DJ grappling with personal problems. Has <laughs> <landed> with the- <laughs> I've never but- wanted to see something that I cannot see. <laughs> so we're going to get back to movies coming up yeah. here in a second, but before we get to, yeah, we're, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get there, but more Christmas news, more talk about that kind of stuff. Um, Janine and I had an opportunity to go to Walt Disney World and sort of scope out the resorts and a couple of the theme parks for the holiday fair. Uh, and I thought we'd do a little, just a little park review, a little, little bit of that. Janine, did you have any thoughts uh, about uh, our little trip? Were there any specific uh, resorts that you that you that really got to your Christmas heart this year? Resorts wise, I don't know. It's hard to say. The Grand Floridian is so grand. Um, so I've been told. But their 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 gingerbread house it was cool. It had a f- couple of fiber optic Christmas trees, which I loved. Um, I liked that. But their gingerbread wasn't good. Yes, let's talk That's about the this. Thing that jumps out at me. So so the tradition, Alonzo, of course, will will fill you in um, mm. as as the probably the only person that's listening theoretically to this podcast um, that doesn't know what we're talking about. <laughs> but um, the Grand Floridian always has a a basically humans you, the their cast members are uh giving away we're well, not giving away ha huh, that's disney selling <laughs> um stuff from inside of the of the gingerbread house to give you gotcha. a sense of scale uh and so it's big and yes janine and i both individually we we went to the resorts at separate times uh got the they one of the things they give out again, I keep saying this, sell for sure, which is way more than it ever should be, is one of the shingles that they kind of use to make the house. Mm-hmm. They're not kidding. It's a shingle. Um, it <laughs> it's is the size of a brick. It is the size of a brick and it tastes like a brick. It's the worst gingerbread I've ever had in my entire life. Like, well, ev- everybody knows architectural gingerbread isn't the same as comestible gingerbread. Like, <laughs> It's not designed to be yummy. It's designed to, to like hold a wall. You know? well, that's, that's true. The thing. It's soft. Yeah, I oh. don't think it's their actual 
used. They're just saying okay. they're not oh, structural. The, they're just uh, like stuck onto the roof. Like so it's shingles. a web of lies. Okay. And, yeah. And so I think they do. It is what they use, but it's not load. It's not load bearing. <laughs> Not up to code. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> load bearing gingerbread. That's now the name of this episode. So. Yeah, really, it's made with molasses. Well, I think they said, and well, nothing else. Okay. And, and As gingerbread just, should. Yeah, that's really fascinating because yeah. they put a lot of like, you know, promo into that gingerbread house. Like they do, and the line we waited for my boyfriend and yeah. I like at least half an hour, and there's two kids behind us came up and they were ordering at the, the little kiosk next to us and they waited in that whole line and it was a brother and sister both maybe 10 and 12 and they both ordered shingles oh my gosh <laughs> the size There's of their all heads all these other treats that are almost certainly 10 times better than the shingles. oh yeah and they both that was their one thing and i wish that i could have seen them <laughs> how much was the shingle janine it was like 11 dollars. yeah wow yeah. Yeah. Well, Google the artist Nayland Blake and Gingerbread because he's actually done yes. installations where he in he'll like in a museum will build a a gingerbread house that you can walk through, and it makes the entire building smell like gingerbread, and it's oh. it, it ties into a whole a section of his aesthetic that has to do with with food and and uh, whatnot. It's it's really you know check it out online. It's pretty yeah, cool. he's amazing. It's the side of the Wonka factory we didn't get to see. So <laughs> yes. What about you, Nathan? What 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 jumped out at you? Oh, I you know it's always going to be Wilderness Lodge for me. I mean you you. You put on, you know, all that sort of log cabin, you know, vibes, and then you add in the wreaths and the and have the fires going. It's about as close to, it. yeah, you just can't beat it. And it's a little off the beaten path from the, the other ones that are on the monorail line. And so it's not as crowded, thank God. Um, and so it's, it's just, it's, you know, you know me, I literally go there to read. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it's cozy. Yeah, it's cozy. You can't, you know. I didn't say I stayed the night. I don't have that kind of money, but um, I'll go and read. Janine and I did, though, meet up and we did Hollywood Studios, which is bar none the best when it comes to Christmas decorations. Yeah. Period. Yeah. I love the uh, those big giant, they do these big giant replicas, at least last time I was there, um, in the planters that look like old 1920s and 30s porcelain blown plastic or porcelain yes. ornaments but they're giant they versions do. of them yep. oh yeah. they're so good they and have the deer and the little creepy QB doll um, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah they're great yeah the doll and, is new and i was not pleased she's a little I, creepy yeah it's, it's good though it's good but it's we good. went speaking of going you know uh somewhere to eat and not be bothered by children running around we went to the brown derby which is always an excellent experience. Um, mm -hmm. And it was your first time, Janine, right? It was, yeah. It was Ooh. my boyfriend's and my first time. It's something that we've both been wanting to do. And miraculously, we were able to get a reservation on Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, it was fantastic. I had the best plant-based risotto I've ever had in my life. And I'm not really someone who likes risotto typically, but that risotto was fantastic. That's kind of that park's equivalent to Carthay, wouldn't you say? Oh, for sure. hundred percent. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 yeah, they have a totally. strong cocktail list. Um, the best cocktail list of any Disney property, I think. I would agree. I remember going to that uh, during gay days one time. And Mar I don't know how they got in the park because they don't allow costumes and things, but there were two drag queens in mm -hmm. the Brown Derby recreating the Lucille Ball and Ethel moment in the Brown Derby from the TV <laughs> show. Wow. <laughs> like, wow. Ethel, give me your compact. Is that William Holden? You know, they, they <laughs> literally the entire scene there and i was like how did they get in i have no idea <laughs> that's remarkable well uh, you know victoria i should open up to you dave as well uh we we sort of we kind of went over a, a little bit of this already for for some of us but um any favorite park christmas what's your favorite christmas park victoria what one do you really feel the christmas spirit at studios because yeah. i'm such an old soul yeah i thrive there it's very, yeah, it's very vintagey. their Christmas. I it's love very, the vintage. Very vibes. 20s to 40s. It's great. Yeah, I really Nathan like was that. saying, like, it is quintessential American Christmas, like, yeah. distilled down yeah. into its purest form. Like, Main it Street really is, is. Main Street's very, I don't know. It's like 1800s Victorian. Eh, yes. It's, it's good. It's a little, you know, Courier and Ives. And, and the thing about... I feel like Hollywood Studios is it lands a little more Bing Crosby. It lands a little more like 
you know, it's that kind of feeling because that's what they're playing to. Um, mm-hmm. And you you can kind of, you can just kind of feel it, you know. Um, yeah. In I the walls, agree. Milton Berle's doing a Christmas special somewhere. You know, it's just that vibe. <laughs> well, and they do and they do the snow at the Tower of Terror and and the whole shebang. So it's always good. But let's get back to Christmas movies that we were talking about earlier. Um, before we get into all of it, though, because we're gonna we're just gonna kind of go through a list of some of the newbies, not necessarily Disney stuff. We'll hit kind of the only Christmas Disney thing going on right now um, that people are talking about. But first, Alonzo, tell us a little bit about your book. Have yourself a movie, Little Christmas, and then of course, Deck the Hallmark, which is another book that you helped co-write. Sure, yeah. So, Have Yourself a Movie, Little Christmas is uh, a sort of a guide to holiday films i kind of felt like nobody had really sort of captured all of that under uh, uh one you know uh, title and uh, you know it's it's a mix of you know if you're looking for elf and it's a wonderful life you know they're absolutely in there but i also you know kind of extend the reach so you know yes Die Hard is a Christmas movie and it's in my book and so is Eyes Wide <laughs> Shut and so is The Lion in Winter and so is Metropolitan you know there are a whole lot of different films I think that incorporate Christmas in different ways and it might not be the one that we think of because Bing Crosby isn't singing in it necessarily but uh, I think for a lot of you know there are people who like different kinds so there's a chapter on horror movie there's a chapter on like um, crime action films you know there's comedies there's movies for kids movies not for kids um, I do a whole chapter of, of Christmas Carol adaptations because there are nice. so many of them and, oh, I, wow. and, I, and I'm only scratching the surface like I'm reading a book that Dave just bought me my husband Dave uh, that is like a, a history of Christmas Carol adaptations Wow! and it like like starting with you know uh, like sort of those um uh, shadow box kind of you know magic lantern versions through wow. like silent the silent films and talkies and then television but i i cover a pretty wide swath i've got you know seymour hicks in 1937 i've got the animated barbie version i've got you know tori <laughs> spelling susan lucci and vanessa williams all playing scrooge you know so it's, you got uh, magoo got, it got magoo yeah. i got you know um uh you know uh cicely tyson like a whole lot of scrooges in there so yeah so that was that was a lot of fun to do and then uh just just last year uh, came out a, a, a second book that I collaborated with the Deck the Hallmark podcast on. It's called I'll Be Home for Christmas Movies. And it's more focused on Hallmark Christmas movies specifically. It's got reviews of more than a hundred Hallmark movies. And the Deck the Hallmark podcast guys are really kind of, they, 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 happened upon i think a brilliant idea for a show because the premise is one of the guys loves these movies one of them likes them and one of them hates them despises them and i kind of feel like no matter what you feel about these movies somebody on that show is going to have your back but i also think that for a lot of us who watch those films regularly we kind of have all of those voices in our head at the same time <laughs> <laughs> kind of battling it out because I'll, I'll i'll be watching everything and you know the, the the film critic side of me is like well this is ridiculous and look at this lighting and you know whatever but then but part of me is like oh but it's so cool they're gonna take a wreath on cookies now you know so, <laughs> so I, I i think they they very they very cannily speak to the multitude of, of of voices in our heads with that i can't recommend uh have yourself a movie little christmas enough i i just finished reading it the other night and uh, uh i watched last night were no angels for the first time thanks to your recommendation oh. uh which oh, wow. is now gonna be on my um uh, my rotation for sure for oh, Peter cool. Ustinov alone. Yes. Uh, it, it's, it's, he, he gets a full star on his own for my rating <laughs> on that movie because he's killing it in the one liner department. For sure. You know, we'll talk about it now. We're going to talk about it a little bit later, but you, you brought up uh, Hallmark movies. And so I thought we would talk about a actual, guys, there has been a movie, a Christmas movie done at a theme park, and it's Christmas at Dollywood. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. Right. Yes. Right. It was just so, on a couple of weeks, like last week, was it? Or on a, like right around Thanksgiving? It, it's from a couple of years ago. Yeah, it's yeah. Oh, is it? It's, yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah. It's from like 2018, 2019. Oh, uh, okay. I just watched it for the first time. Yeah. But Alonzo, I wanted your movie critic <laughs> vibes <laughs> about the excellent uh, Christmas at Dollywood, and excellent is definitely in quotes and asterisk. Um, but uh, yeah, what did you th- what did you think about that? There's not a lot of theme park Christmas movies out there, so I, you know. 
I picked True. it. True. I I think it's the one. Uh, well, bold choice to put a build a movie around Dolly Parton and then not have her sing in it. Yeah. Uh, you know, which I guess there's like there's the rate card. You know, you, <laughs> you want me in your movie at my theme park? Oh, you want a song too? Uh, sorry, that's all. That's past your budget, Hallmark. Uh, you know, these are these are the people who had Mariah Carey quote unquote direct a Christmas movie that she's briefly <laughs> in and also not sing. So you know, I, this seems to be a pattern, I guess. Um, yeah, Christmas Dollywood is, you know, it, it it is the classic trope that existed until about 2020. And they're, you can tell they're trying to step away from it. But if you want your classic busy gal from the big city comes home to the small town and falls in love with a guy there, you know, Hallmark trope, this movie is definitely fulfilling that. It just happens that the small town in this case is Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, uh, <laughs> coincidentally, the home of Dollywood. And so uh, Danica McKellar plays a uh, New York City party planner who's just coming home with her daughter to spend the holidays with her family and not work. But then, wouldn't you know it, Dollywood is celebrating its 30th anniversary and they want her to come in and make it splashy. And this makes her butt heads with their operations manager played by Hallmark hunk Niall Mater. How will it all work out? I'm sure you can't begin to get <laughs> Yeah, there's definitely not a template. Um, <laughs> um, it's funny, though, when you mentioned that, I thought it was a different movie that I just watched recently. NBC has rectified that problem. Dolly Parton's ago. Mountain Magic Christmas. Yes. Mountain Magic Christmas, mm -hmm. where she oh. does sing. Yeah, yes. that's what she, I thought you were talking about. She also sings in Dolly Parton's Christmas on the Square, which was on Netflix, oh, on Netflix and which, yeah. which won an Emmy as best <laughs> TV movie. I'm like... Really? What, <laughs> oh. what other TV movies were there for the entire year? Because that's not a good one. How many Dolly Parton Christmas movies are there? Well, there's a bunch. There's there's two different Code of Many Colors ones. Mm -hmm. There's one where she, from years ago where she plays an angel. Um, <laughs> As she should. I, I want to say there's one with like Lee Majors or something. No, I, it, it, really? Wow. She, she's been doing what? this for a while now. <laughs> Lee Majors. All of a yeah. sudden, I'm I'm far more interested. A Smoky Mountain Christmas. A Smoky yeah. Mountain Christmas. Yep. Okay. Well, it, well, I feel like we're going to, I'm taking the room down because we're going to have to talk <laughs> just for a second uh, about the Santa Clauses. Uh, <laughs> and it doesn't have to be long, but it is the only Disney Plus. Well, there's that. And Alonzo, I don't know if you've seen Hip Hop Nutcracker. I've not. Oh, I have. <laughs> oh, please tell me. Because Netflix did a doc a couple years ago called Hot Chocolate Nutcracker about a thing that Debbie Allen puts on in L.A. every year, which was pretty good. But I have not seen Hip Hop Nutcracker. Please tell me v everything. Victoria, yesterday you told me you had not watched Hip Hop, Hip -Hop Nutcracker and you laughed at me. I rectified it. No, you I laughed because I was like, ain't no way they went from Run's house to fucking this. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I laughed. So review it for me. I didn't even add it because I didn't think you'd seen it. It's it's about what you expect from Rev Run, so explain to the white people what that means, please. <laughs> so, um, for those who have watched Run's house, um, Rev Run was part of a group, Run DNC. Right. He was he was the pastor of the group, obviously. Had a reality TV show with his family. It was very goofy, very much him just being like a authoritative father figure of sorts but he, he's like he was comedic with it right. essentially it's the same thing with hip-hop okay this was a stage show first right they did it in new york as a as a, a stage show in new york i think maybe i don't yeah, know yeah I, I, I think it, it's I only no idea it's only 45 minutes i think is is what shocked me too is huh. it's a it's a real short show for the nutcracker yeah it's a live i just found it. it's a live tour as well that's where okay. it started there you go. There's a little review of that. Let's talk about Santa Clauses, though. We'll do it very quickly. Uh, I, I... Isn't he problematic? <laughs> a touch. Yeah. yeah. A touch. Yeah. It's probably I mean, why I didn't watch this. <laughs> it, it's very a did we need this? Like, is this a story that really needed to be re revisited? And I mean, I guess if the idea is I don't want the lingering taste of three to be the last <laughs> thing that people have of this <laughs> franchise, that I would admire, I would uh, honor as a reason to do it. But it, I will say I haven't watched the whole thing. I watched like the first three or four episodes and there was a couple of things per episode that did make me laugh. 
there was some line or line delivery or Laura San Giacomo popping up as a lava fauna, you know, that I was like, okay, well, that's funny. Like, I, I still haven't even gotten to the Krumholtz episodes, which was really the only reason I was watching. So I guess I have to forge ahead to get me some Krumholtz. I'll wait till you tell me on Linoleum Knife that Krum, what episode Krumholtz is in, because it's literally the only thing I care about at this point. Yeah. If we're not going to get Spencer Breslin back. Yeah, he's the re- the real star of the franchise was Krumholtz. Numb three years for life. Um. <laughs> I grew up on the first one. One holds up. I'll defend one. Yeah, one's fine. Yeah, first one's fine. Didn't di- isn't in the series? Doesn't doesn't he like? I haven't watched it all yet. Doesn't he make a joke about like how you can't say Merry Christmas anymore? Christmas is canceled. Wokeness uh, joke. Yes, he does. <sighs> Got to keep those can't... Fox News bona fides up, you know. Uh, I, the, there was a funny tweet response to that that I did see. It says Santa had the red hat all along. We just ignored it. <laughs> <laughs> too much michigan he's had too much michigan <laughs> i can't what i will say about the first one though is it does have john judge reinhold um yes. that counts for a lot he's not he's not off to the side and he does get to say the line uh christmas came no weenie whistle um which was then a couple years ago my parents for christmas got me a little weenie whistle they they, nice. they were around so that was nice. a Christmas came and I got a weenie whistle. So life's good. Um, let's talk about a couple of the others. Christmas Story Christmas. We'll start with that. It's sort of the, what's the term for it now? It's like a legacy sequel, but it's I mean, yeah, it's, like like a sequel is what they call it. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, who all saw it? I saw it. I know Alonzo's seen it. I saw that's the first job. 20 minutes. Does that count? <laughs> <laughs> you gave up. You gave up. Well, um, I was looking for White Christmas, and then I got mad because it wasn't on HBO Max anymore. And that's actually how I found out about A Christmas Story Christmas, and I started to watch it, and then I got bored, and I turned it off. White Christmas is on Netflix. I found it. Okay. okay. <laughs> when you go from Danny Kaye to, to Peter Billingsley, n- no shade on his <laughs> part, but I understand. Um, uh, Alonzo, what'd you think? It hit some notes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I did not grow up, you know, super into Christmas story. Like it, I I was, I was, I didn't see it in its original release, although I could have, I was 16 when it came out and I caught up with it years later. It's like, okay, it's funny. And I, I get why people like this movie. But what I think is interesting is that when that movie came out, the whole point of it was that it was sort of anti-nostalgic that it was, it was kind of meant to sort of poke, uh, put a pin in, you know, pop the balloon of the sort of Norman Rockwell vision of Christmas as we remember it and be like, well, actually, you know, the kids were mean and greedy and the adults were obsessed with their own nonsense and not really paying attention. And, you know, and that was the joke. And that was the whole point of it that I think that it made it appealing to people because if they had imperfect Christmases of their own, they realized that they weren't the only ones and mm-hmm. that, 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 that we've been fed a lie all these years, basically. Hmm. But that movie has now become this institution of Christmas. And so people <laughs> are nostalgic for it. And yeah. that's what this movie is. And I think the movie operates best when they make up new things and they make yeah. up new gags and new sort of takes on Christmas, like the part where they're hiding from the carolers, for mm. instance, I thought that was really funny. The egg for the radiator I thought was pretty good. Yeah. There's, yeah. There's little the, moments like that. The casseroles, they're... you know, just yeah. the, the, very, the specific stuff. But man, this movie is such a souvenir photo book of the first movie. <laughs> like they keep <laughs> referencing it. They show clips from it. They repeat gags again. It's like, just be a movie like yeah it, it it has no life of its own it, it hangs off the side of a christmas story not only that but i also felt when i was over that it had too much actual movie um they there's an actual plot uh, i uh, beyond ralphie having a singular goal of getting yeah. the rifle um it's very much like he it's goes the gene shepherd origin story yeah he goes through an arc and like and it just felt like for me I kind of want less. I want more vignette business going on. Yeah. I want it to feel like separate little stories. And and this really tried to like tie it all together. And I kind of felt it was unnecessary. Some of that, you know, he's in the attic and writing and looking at stuff. I kind of had a, like my eyes fell so far into the back of my skull. <laughs> I, I didn't know what to do. What's funny though, you mentioned Gene Shepard and, and, and kind of his, you know, kind of look at nostalgia for us 
theme park nerds, he's the voice of the Carousel of Progress, which is all about um, nostalgia. So sure. it's it's really funny uh, to see him sort of live in that in between of <laughs> uh, uh, you know those were the days, and we're right. in, but also uh, having a commentary on it. And I think you're right. Part of the appeal of the original Christmas story is that it's so episodic, and that's yeah. why it loans itself yeah. to those those 24 hour screenings yeah, on whatever can catch network. 10 minutes. Yeah. Turns out, yeah. You can, yeah. While you're doing something else and then go, or you can come in the middle, see it and then like catch the beginning of the next one. But yeah, this one is very much trying to sort of do that more classic, you know, screenplay structure. And it's, and, and again, it just expends so much energy reminding you how much you like that other movie. And it's like, well, yeah, <laughs> we, that's a, We could take that as a given we're here because we yeah. like that other movie, <laughs> but we're here to see another movie. I mean, I got to see Drunk Julie Haggerty. So there's something. There is that. Yes. But yeah. I, I, would, I would like to know why you no know Melinda Dillon. Like, she is alive. Yeah, I, I don't know what she's up to. Yeah, she's not she dead. She yeah. is alive. Yeah, you could just bring her back. Um, that's a, that's a strange one. Let's go to a better one. Uh, Spirited. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed Spirited. I, I did, too. I, I, I won't talk. I won't talk about the twist. Um, we'll keep that secret, though it's not that big of a secret if you if you're paying attention, I think. But um gosh, you know, two for two on the Will Ferrell Christmas movie uh attempts, I think at this Yeah, point. totally. They're to instantly two of my favorites, both yeah. of them. Like Yeah, where's it land on the Christmas Carol spectrum, Dare Alonzo? Um I, I think it's great. And and I think that it, it is it is a it's a smart take on the the story because you know christmas carols have a have a shape to them and we know what they're going to be and this one actually sort of has the hoots but a stand back and go but like how long does that last yeah. like how long how how, how permanent is this or is yeah. it, does this wear does the glow wear off and they just slowly turn into a crappy person again you know and so that's kind of the, th the the narrative thrust here of this idea of like are there people who are absolutely beyond redemption but also are the redeemed people forever changed do they flip a switch or is it about you know like a steady progress of like, you know, uh, as, as I talked about it on deck, the hallmark, the Dan uh, Thompson quoted uh, frozen two and said, is this about the next good thing? You mm -hmm. know, the, the, the next good act basically. Um, so yeah, I, I thought that was all really interesting. And then just above that, like it's a big splashy musical uh, featuring songs that I liked from songwriters that I generally don't. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I, there were a couple that actually kind of caught my ear. The the less they tried to do the Broadway e current new vibe, and the mm. more like when when Ronald Reynolds is doing his basically you got trouble uh, for the <laughs> the tree salesman. Like it's very old school kind of Broadway sound. And when they, no. every time they tap into that, I feel like it really kind of kicks. Um, I'd love to see this on stage. I think it'll end up there sometime. Oh sure. Uh, for sure. I, I mean, like this is a movie that is so overstuffed that one of my favorite songs is one that they they begin and then stop and then cut and they <laughs> put it over the closing credits. <laughs> right? They realized like they they they, they 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 was just they were front loading so much they had to get to the actual story. Uh, but it's a terrific song. So yeah. you know, there, there's so much and the choreography is just dynamite throughout and so many different choices like the the each song kind of has its own feel and its own structure in terms of like what the dance is like and like there's a whole thing involving flashlights that i, I said in my review like cash strapped drama departments in high schools everywhere will be trying to figure out <laughs> how to like work that in because it's very simple but very cool yeah yeah it's just a fog machine and and fingers crossed the smoke alarm doesn't go off um <laughs> you'll you'll figure it out drama club let's go to the last one kind of the newbies which is violent night i saw violent night it's still in theaters so i'm sure some of uh yeah. you all haven't had a chance i saw it i saw it uh it's a as I said in in my letterbox review, I just said, is the classic? No. Will I throw it on when I'm drunk on Christmas Eve? Probably. Sure. <laughs> you know, it I think it's exactly what the trailer promises and no more. That, 100%. that was sort of that like it, it if you're going in for David Harbour bloodily kicking the crap out of lots of people as magical Santa Claus is the real one. <laughs> Great. You're in for good. You're in for a good third act. I thought it, it had some sort of pacing issues for me in the beginning. And, and there's some great little character moments, but it, it really is 
all just leading up to the bloodiest, goriest. Like, what if Home Alone was really R rated? Basically, is what's happening. Yeah. Um, oh dear. And when they do that, when they really homage Home Alone, it's actually yeah. I thought pretty fun, like horrifying too. Just totally horrifying. horrifying. The latter gag is just oh boy. Oh. It's just I guess I was expecting Santa to have. I mean, they they hint at this backstory, right? They hint at that he was some sort of warrior and he's thousands of years old. And, yeah, it's the Northmen somehow. But it's time. right. But it's just such a tease because, like, when it comes down to his magic, he he always answers like I don't, I don't know how it works either, right? Which is yeah. fine and funny. But I kept waiting for more Santa magic to be part of the solution. However, the final gag at the yeah, end, it's the final it. kill, yeah, it's worth it. is completely worth that setup if that's his only magic gag, right? I don't want to spoil it, but it's horrifying and hilarious and like a perfect cherry on the top for that very, very, very violent third act. I, I really loved this movie. And I think that <laughs> I, 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 because I went in with such trepidation because yeah. it is taking on stuff that has been the ruin of so many movies. Like I've seen so many terrible Santa movies. I've seen so many terrible, like it's Christmas, but it's a bloody genre movie. Whoa. Am I blowing your mind yet? You know what? Uh, Fat Man came out two years ago, three years ago yes, at this point, yeah, which is the yeah. Mel Gibson version, basically 2020. Uh, yeah, which was again, it was a sort of, eh, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then when you throw in like it's a it's a hard R action movie, but also like a major plot point is a young girl's belief in Santa, yeah. uh, and uh, and uh, these homages to Home Alone that are not only like overt but spoken aloud. Yeah. Like, all <laughs> yeah. of these things could be like, oh, that could be really terrible, and it's not. Like I, I and and again, I, I did see it like in a packed theater it was at beyond fest so I, you know i'm sure that probably helped because everybody was just really jazzed about it but i just i just thought they took on a lot of things that have that could have gone south easily and and made it work and and the performances are, are really fun uh you know eddie patterson from from uh, righteous gemstones and cam gigandit i think is gonna finally become somebody i want to see in movies because i think he's in on the joke now yeah. that he's absurdly <laughs> <Yeah>. handsome <laughs> but like is kind of a stiff and but he's playing around with that image that he has in movies and is a, a, a delight here you know and so yeah i i just enjoyed myself from start to finish i really love leah brady too i loved the, mm -hmm. the little girl she was yeah. fantastic like talk about i was ready that to could have been so gooey yeah. oh yeah it should have been yeah it could have been gooey and awful and let yet in the mm -hmm. middle of all this third act gore they sort of pull off this really couple of sweet moments and i was like yeah is this movie making me feel fuzzy for Christmas while also <laughs> chopping people's heads off? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. That's the magic of Violent Night. <laughs> I, I suppose I wish that some of the family members, I guess I would say, played it a little more straight. I, I feel like Santa needs to be the joke. And, and the movie has a tonal problem already being a Christmas uh, slash violent film. And then it kind of goes into these dives of, of jokes uh, at times it, it, it kind of just it's not bad it's just sort of unsettled in kind of what it wants to hit you're, you're making me realize that i have to put it alongside like triangle of sadness and the menu and glass onion all these movies about like how billionaires are despicable yeah we have despicable <laughs> oh, billionaires here too <laughs> yeah yeah let's uh, yeah luckily they don't need anybody to fish for them um if you've seen triangle of sadness you know what i'm talking about um <laughs> So I think this is a good transition. Dave, I think you'll agree. Uh, let's go from uh, uh, a shirtless David Harbour um, to sexiest movie Santas. I'm going to pick our sexiest movie Santas. Uh, I have my pick. I'm fairly certain about this one, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll start with Dave. Dave, do you have a sexy Santa that you prefer at this holiday season? Well, I mean... I will say my first crush ever as a as a young man was Yukon Cornelius in the original animated specials. I mean, when you look at the man I married, he's basically Canadian <laughs> that can wear a toque and a big red beard. Like I've married Yukon Cornelius, is not no lie. Um, uh, well but played. now he's but now he's turning into Bumbles because he's gone completely white. Beard, so I get, I get the best of both worlds. Um, no, I, I would. You know, it's a fairly recent one actually, and that would be Kurt Russell. Same. Yeah, that's my pick. Kurt Russell yep. is so freaking handsome and hot in that outfit like i kept going wait why am i am i thirsting for santa claus here is this what's going on? it was very it was disorienting late, for me late, late <laughs> santa fetish yeah he was but on top of that i i think the movie's really great and he's really great in it um mostly it's good because of him i think but the rest some of it falls apart but he's so freaking handsome in that that would be my choice 
I, this is going to be a quick segment because I'm also Russell. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, you know what's funny about I saw him do uh, at Epcot. He read the the Christmas story, which they have a bunch of people come in and do, and they have music and all of that um, for the candlelight processional. And I was uh, probably a football field away, and I still was like, "Damn, that man is handsome!" Like just from a distance, you're just like, "Man, he just man," and he still had his like Ga- Guardians of the Galaxy beard going on, like he was still full into it. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, I could say from personal experience, from a distance, uh, when he still kind of looks like Santa, uh, that's my pick. But uh, Alonzo, where do you land on this sexy Santa Claus? You you have all the Santas. You've seen him. Uh, yeah, I mean, Kurt Russell certainly up there. Uh, David Harbour, I think, is, is a, a new addition to the canon yeah. of the sexy Dad Santa. Uh, for me personally, and this maybe says a lot about just my sort of general taste in this sort of thing, but I got to go Paul Giamatti and uh, 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 Fred Claus. Uh, very good because <laughs> paul giamatti not a santa is like my jam so throw him in that red suit and a white beard i'm like i'm in <laughs> victoria finish this off you got a sexy santa i i do now i was prepared for favorite movie santas and i was gonna say richard atterborough but <laughs> well, we'll get to favorite we'll get to favorites we'll get to favorites i, sw- I flipped it for the transition I was richard like, atterborough is not I... unsexy yeah he's a good looking like, santa that's why I was like, do I do I still say him? But no, um, I do not remember his name for this movie. But um, it was it was a guy that played Santa in a Bad Mom's Christmas. Oh, Ooh, Justin Hartley. That's who it is from This Is Us. Yeah, he's a Santa yes. stripper. <laughs> okay, we'll count it. I don't know if that's Good technically choice. a real Santa, but we'll go with Santa strippers, <laughs> I suppose. He is Santa to me. He's a Santa so. in our hearts for yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And by that rule, I would also add Mackay Pfeiffer in this Christmas. Okay, see so okay. now we're now we're just adding. Like, I guess I have to open it up if it's sexy Santa Clauses. That's my fault. Alonzo, who played? Who's the voice in Arthur Christmas of Stephen Claus? Uh, so, that's Hugh, it's uh, Hugh Laurie. Hugh Laurie. Yeah. Oh, it's Hugh Laurie, right? Yeah. He was. I mean, for an animated character, he was sort of jacked and you know oh, military looking. As animated Santas go, the yeah, Steve's a good block. He had sort of this. <laughs> he had that sort of flat top, silver flat top, silver fox goatee. Like it was kind of hot. <laughs> that's a that's a if you guys haven't seen arthur christmas that is became one of my favorites because oh, of alonzo he's so good he, he's like you need to watch. i hadn't seen it in the theaters and it's now a staple for me yeah it's it's completely pure it's a, it's a wonderful very pure it's a lovely wonderful film i um, like it the same crew of course arvin did a uh a holiday special for sean the sheep as well recently mm. Um, and it's just as good. Sean, for anyone who doesn't know about the Sean the Sheep series, uh, it's all pretty much silent. It's all physical acclamation comedy. Um, and so it's a whole Christmas special uh, of kind of silent comedy, which is, it's very, very funny. Um, so I recommend that. Recommend uh, Unaccompanied Minors is the other one that Alonzo recommended to me <laughs> that is now one of my favorites every year. If you've never seen that about the teenagers yes. who are stuck in the airport on Christmas Eve. Oh. Uh, let's talk about favorite Santa Clauses real quick, and then we're going to dive into a, a a parade special to kind of finish this off. Um, favorite Santa Clauses. Um, let's let's go backwards. Victoria, you started. You said Rich Nettenborough, right? Yeah, but I was torn because I do like both Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street, so I like both of the actual guys that played. Santa Edmund Edmund Gwynn is my favorite Santa Claus of all time, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Like yeah. I was very torn, but because I grew up, I grew up with Richard. But, mm. And then I looked at the older version. I was like, damn, he's a good Santa Claus. Good Santa so Claus. I, I'm just like, mm, it's a tie for me. Our only Oscar winning Santa. It's true. It's true. Santa true. Claus Kampuncha. Um, <laughs> Vic- <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. Uh, Janine, do you have a favorite Santa? If I pull something out of a hat maybe because it's just the most recent movie i've seen santa claus from nightmare before christmas okay that's good sure. he doesn't the great thing about that santa claus is he very much is upset with the whole scenario like he, yeah. he never he never kind of goes jolly with it for the full extent he, he plays it fully straight which i it's like great. the straight guy generally i appreciate so, i appreciate yeah. that and yeah. that's also me just like pulling something out of like i haven't thought about this thoroughly at all <laughs> that's fine but i've also <laughs> seen like no movies i've seen no movies my choice would be would be i'm uh, miracle on 31st street is way up there but my choice would actually be ed asner and elf okay. oh mm. oh that's a good option because he's really he's really kind of like 
he reminds me he's of Ed my, yeah, he's at <laughs> first of all it's just that asner right but yeah. he reminds me of like if my dad was really santa he would be that kind of frumpy and, <laughs> and a little yeah. cranky and yeah and and i just he's a he's a, a modern one that really sort of sticks with me i want to change it okay <laughs> i don't I, klaus oh yeah yeah yes. oh, klaus, that yes. that is actually oh. my favorite that is a good santa my runner up before we get to Alonzo's answer is, and I always have to say this too, because I feel like the Edwin Gwynn one's kind of easy. I actually think uh, Douglas Seal and Ernest Saves Christmas is one of the best Santas of all time. Um, yeah. Seconded. Yes, yeah, definitely. It, he, I don't know. He's some, and I don't think that movie, I think that movie is pretty good for being yeah. a, a movie created in Orlando. <laughs> in the, the first to be shot on the, the first Orlando to be shot studios. Yeah. yeah at MGM, um, which you can see when you would, uh, ladies and gents, if you go and you watch um, Santa enter to go to the movie stage where he's going to see, was it Santa's sleigh? I think is there yeah. something like that? Um, it, outside in that, when he passes there's just like the trolley from main street like there's just stuff uh it's just the back <laughs> lot of mgm uh back in the day um which is pretty wonderful but yeah douglas seal uh, is is incredible alonzo where do you land i mean i'm a purist i i think you know edmund gwen is really great and and i think that it, it it just holds up so well and i mean i i i think i i saw his version before seeing the attenborough but and as much as i like the attenborough and i think you know it's it's that was a tough to step into the those boots but uh but yeah i think edmund gwen is still a champ and of recent years this is uh maybe with an asterisk but i really like anna kendrick and noel interesting oh, yeah she's great mm. interesting yeah that that scene where she doesn't know she knows sign language is mm. such a lovely oh, little christmas so... moment it was it so was. good and when when the suit finally fits you know yeah mm. yeah did <laughs> didn't didn't um jim broadbent play him he in played in arthur, christmas. in arthur christmas he's yeah. the he's the outgoing santa but isn't there another there's a live action one uh there's a british comedy that i've never seen called get santa that he's ah uh, okay i think i saw it in passing on cable Have once I seen like, that? <laughs> yeah evident, i i re if i remember it's like he's stuck in prison for like most of the movie or something i think so yeah that I've sounds seen, accurate yeah i've yeah. never seen get santa and i've never seen nativity exclamation point which was also a big hit in Ooh. uh on my list i have the first and the second because the first has martin freeman and the second has david tennant um and i i don't know i don't know it's one of those that i know i'm i'm biting a a bullet and and, and just watching it but uh, oh I, i've been so avoiding the new animated christmas carol on netflix which incorporates <laughs> songs from the 1970 version which i love yeah. but like i saw that trailer i was like Oh, I don't know about this. And then it got like a one star review in the guardian. So it's just <laughs> sitting in my queue, taunting me, but I'm mean, at one point, I'm just going to have to like break down and take a look at it. It's <laughs> job. Well, um, let us break down something that uh, some of us got the chance to sort of uh, peruse, which is one of oh. my favorite things to watch. Uh, while I'm wrapping gifts, uh, I watched anywhere between the 1992 and the 1996 uh, Walt Disney World Very Merry Christmas Parades. Uh, this year, we are covering the 94 Walt Disney World Christmas Parade, which I believe uh, is probably the most 90s thing that's ever been created. Uh, <laughs> Agreed. A hundred percent. That is peak 90s, that entire special from front to back. Um, to begin, it begins with literally Bill and Hillary Clinton uh, giving us a message from the White House. Um, and uh, goes on to our hosts, uh, Regis, Philbin, and Joan London. So that's what we're talking about here. We're really we're really wow. into it. Initial thoughts, anyone? Anyone have some initial thoughts? It reminded me that Regis Philbin was dead. Same. That's sad. That's sad. I know. That's, that's how it started off for me, so I was very <laughs> sad. <laughs> it, it was the one year when Margaret Cho was an employee of Disney, and it's just so weird watching her try to, like, pretzel herself into what they want in this like schmaltzy infomercial of a christmas special yeah especially when you remember like if you've ever listened to her stand-up she talks about like what a nightmare that show was and how they're always you know getting on her for being too fat and for just like it was just a, a miserable experience for her doing that show and to see her being like the good employee and going down to orlando and riding on the tower of terror is just like oh Mark. yeah oh yeah mm. It was painful to watch. It was yeah. really painful to watch. I feel like you and could see her blink and it, like there was some, <laughs> some message 
because it it does not look like she's enjoying herself at mm. any point. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> and on top of that, then you add on top of that that layer of '90s video production cheese that they right. slathered on Ooh. stupid sound effects, <laughs> dumb angles, a cartoon wow 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 boop 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 little bullshit stuff. It's just. That entire special had that too. It just went on and on and on with all these weird '90s ticks. Um, extreme, it, yeah. yeah. Everything's extreme. Free roll-ups, right? It, um, <laughs> it, it also felt like, um, and this is sort of inside baseball to theme park stuff, is that those are the Eisner era years when he That's was true. very, very, very um, strong on we need the teenagers to come to this park. It's not just princesses and cartoon characters. We need to get the teen audience, specifically his son, Brock. Like if it, it <laughs> he would bring Brock in on, I'm serious. I, yeah. I have stories from Imagineering friends. He would bring in Brock as a teenager oh. to Imagineering pitches. And if, you know, if Bro Brock was like Caesar over there with thumbs up and oh. thumbs down. The, the director of Sahara? The director oh. of Sahara. Yeah, let's just leave it to that. <laughs> Um, but like when you look at the promos for like Honey, I Shrunk the Audience and Alien Encounter and Tower of Terror, it's like the, the Honey, I Shrunk the Audience. If you never saw the show, it's kind of innocuous. It's a it's a light family comedy with a couple of fun 3D gags. They literally make it look like a horror movie. Yeah, <laughs> like they make it look scary as hell. And it was like, I mean, Dave, eight year old me thought that was scary. Oh, OK, sure. I'm oh, fair, fair. <laughs> Fair. Fair. There were rats, Dave, and they were at my there feet. There were. <laughs> there was a cat that turned into a lion. It was very scary. Um, I mean, there is a. I mean, there is a snake that jumps. I mean, there's some moments, but you're absolutely correct. They, they, they all do that 3D pose. The whole thing is their hands are up and they're like ah the whole time. Yeah, ah, it, yeah. The whole thing feels like pandering to hey, 16 year olds, you're gonna love this. You know. Yeah. 100%, uh, including, of course, Jonathan Taylor Thomas, because Regis isn't going to bring him in, but Jonathan Taylor Thomas joins us to uh, preview the Lion King parade at Disneyland, because he's over there, and then also the Indiana Jones adventure, uh, which, again, is this total like mix of uh, him running through cues, and then also like they they kind of put the camera to the to his right, and he does all these corny-ass jokes that Bruce Valanche wrote at some point <laughs> like uh, the jokes were killing me did he I'm really did, did they, Bruce they, no but it just sounds like, oh, it sounds like so it. okay <laughs> i mean yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, whoever whoever shot all this there they, they didn't there was never a dutch angle they didn't like because no. it was always like the weirdest <laughs> yeah. meh, meh, you know but the greatest part about this special hands down Without the sweaters that people are wearing in the crowd. Well, there's sweaters. so many great sweaters. <laughs> sweaters. The sweaters were the shit, though. The 90s, yeah. the there's the no so many really good sweaters. That 90s color palette. It's like purple and yellow and red. and I was It's back, heaven. baby. It's, it's coming back. back. Sure. It's yeah. back. Yeah. I'm ready. <laughs> I mean, the retro Disney merch that, I mean, they're where there is, it's so funny now because if you go on Etsy or whatever, people have reprinted, like in the computer, redesigned the old opening day, like, shirts and and that kind of stuff from the 90s and they're going like hotcakes because people really love that vibe uh literally because i showed janine one and she was like i'm buying that immediately just the other day um can i but, get some yeah. acid washed overalls and a mom jean cut yeah it's a real, a real <laughs> blossom uh if you were um let's talk though about the best part which of course is the opening of planet hollywood at pleasure island Whoa. which features arnold rosie stallone uh cindy crawford Bruce Willis and to me, Kenny G, Kenny, Bruce Willis and Kenny G performing on stage. Yes. Yes. Let's talk about this. We're, what we're actually talking about here is Willis performing. We got Bruno performing Bruno. with mm -hmm. Kenny G and Demi dancing. That is, that is, a, Willis, that is the most nineties sentence I've ever heard. Saying that's a time capsule. It yeah. literally threw me for such a loop. <laughs> had to own a chunk of a restaurant to have a place that would let him sing <laughs> like, uh, you know but the the, the whole planet hollywood phenomenon is such a cra i so that's a book that somebody needs to write mm. like oh, i know yeah. there's i know there's I still a, there's still a planet hollywood like resort in vegas so i guess it's not entirely dead but like that moment they opened i remember in dallas when they opened it it was such a big to do but like memorabilia and that terrible Captain Crunch chicken and like but the idea that like you might see stars that own this place it was just it was it, the the apex of the theme restaurant gone oh. just berserk 
I mean, it's the nineties. They try to make it the nineties Brown Derby, literally. Like that was the Oof. like, uh, come here it and, really and see the stars. It, it, it just reminds me of when 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 uh, the Simpsons go to like a TJ Fridays and Marge is like, look a slot on the wall, you know, like <laughs> big signs indoors, whatever. Um, <laughs> But like, yeah, you'll either see a celebrity or you might see Martin Landau's cape from Ed Wood. Yeah, I like to, <laughs> let's acknowledge that we've always agreed that for the most part, it's shitty, weird props at at, at these places oh. um, with the occasional gym at, at the front, basically, is what they do. Um, but what I loved was that Joan London hurt like the one clip of here are the props we got. Uh, is Martin Lando's cape from Ed Wood? And she goes, remember Ed Wood? Like, no, your audience, no. <laughs> Christmas morning children do not remember Ed Wood. But, uh, well, I mean, this was, this was 94. And that, I mean, didn't Ed Wood come out in 94 or 93? Like it was still, it was fresh and new yeah. and it was a Disney property. That, well, that's why it was pinpointed for sure. Um, um, and, and then you have Rosie fat shaming herself because, oh, God. Uh, mm. yeah. that was really cringe. Oh, that was God. cringy. Yeah. yeah, who was she standing next to? It was Cindy Crawford, right? Yeah, and yeah. they're like yeah. sucking in their cheeks to, because the, she's standing next to them. We're like, oh my god, that was this isn't 90s. that long ago. Like yeah. the only way you can make it as a f person who's fat is to like make yourself the butt of the joke, and then it's yeah. like, yeah, you can mm -hmm. laugh at me. I can laugh with me. It's not laughing at me. You're laughing with me. And that was the only that's way. How, that's yeah. how you get your own talk show. Yeah. Well, then that evolved, I think, into like Fat Amy from the. Uh, from the pitch perfect movies which was basically i'm making the joke also fuck you yeah you know, that, that, right. that, that's the next step of that yeah. yeah and did you see the size of the crowd like oh it's mammoth huge. it's yeah. it's bigger than a movie preview it was unbelievable and the stars were riding it on harleys and stuff like it was just peak peak 90s excess it was true 90s a, a joel yeah. silver production <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. Here's the hint. The the, the 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 dirty secret that they never want to tell you is that movie stars want to eat at places where no one is going to notice them <laughs> and, or, right. or bother them. You know, so like they are never going to set foot in Planet Hollywood. They will be eating at restaurants that you can never ever afford because they don't want to be near you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it's the truth. I think every celebrity yeah. that showed up on that carpet for that was like a part owner or had a an share investor. Or two, right? Yeah. For I'm sure. pretty sure. It had like. To it, be. Yeah, 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 for sure. But if you don't think that's '90s enough, uh, uh, check this special out because we didn't even get to Nancy Kerrigan. I mean, come on, skating in front of the castle, <laughs> like a year after the the, the almost, accident, right? Almost to the day, yeah, almost to the day, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, she got herself some hot water at another point, not in that special, but she had said um during a disney parade that it, she says she was saying that it's uh, she says like oh this is stupid like i this is really dumb i shouldn't be here um and she says she's talking about wearing her medals like she never wears her medals in in parades or whatever but like it's just this like live clip that disney it got out of her like kind of literally talking to mickey mouse waving going this is really stupid <laughs> so i like her more now <laughs> yeah, and I bet the special was like you are doing this. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and you are gonna you're gonna mm. skate in the middle of Florida. You're gonna do it, and you are and gonna smile. Like it. You're gonna yeah. smile, damn it. Um, but anyway, check that out. It's on it's on YouTube. All of them are on YouTube, basically. Uh, they, I think they did this. I think they started in '83, if I remember correctly. And if I'm if I'm right, uh, all of them are available, and you get. All I mean, man, if you want time capsules, it's the best place to go. So we're going to finish, uh, though, tonight with uh, personal family Christmas traditions. What what personal family Christmas traditions do you all have in your family? Dave, do you have any? Nothing too special. I think always the, um, you know, the we do one present on Christmas Eve. That was always a big thing. Um, another one was I was not a kid that bought Santa Claus for for long like i knew the jig was up pretty early um but my my grandfather started a trend uh of like when it st st stuff came from santa quote unquote he would make up funny weird dumb names so it'd be like from sandy fingers from sandy claws from <laughs> the, the man with the bag right so that's that's a, a thing it's about half the presents into the tree will have some and then and the older we got the dirtier those names got you know <laughs> um, oh dear so yeah yeah. So I, I, you know, nothing too out of the ordinary. I think those would be the big ones. 
for me, uh, this started when we moved to Florida because we have no family down here. And when you don't have any family on Christmas Eve, you don't have an obligation anymore to, to you don't, and no one's making you dinner, <laughs> which are, you're not bringing <laughs> half of it. Um, so uh, we, one year we just, we, we didn't know what to do. And I said, let's just get red lobster. And so since then we've gotten red lobster for every Christmas Eve for the last, I think three years, four years. I'm not saying it's great, but I'm saying it's <laughs> very enjoyable and I don't have to make it. Um, and Cheddar Bay biscuits on Christmas Eve. That's the shit. Yeah. Um, so that's been ours recently. So, uh, you know, I'll, uh, I'll be eating a cheddar bay, uh, come the 24th. Um, Janine, <laughs> what about you? My big one is my mom and I tend to make Norwegian Christmas cookies every year. So we make krumkaka, which is like a, people kind of liken it to a cannoli, but it's not. Um, it's like a cardamom crispy cookie that's in a cone. It's delicious and magical and a pain in the ass to make. And then <laughs> Berliner Kranze, which is like a, it has like two dozen egg yolks, hard boiled, pushed through a sieve cookies that are the best cookies that you'll ever have. And they're hard fought and a pain in the ass to make. I need recipes for these. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jean, yeah. yeah. Recipes, please. You are coming to my house for a Christmas party this weekend. And so... I'm baking cookies on Friday. <laughs> All so... right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I won't come empty handed. Good. You are my Norwegian ambassador and I appreciate it very much. <laughs> Victoria, what about you? What do you got? I don't know if this is normal or not. I'm going to be honest. Honey, um, I get so... red lobster. You can say whatever you want. <laughs> well, fair. So um, back when I was younger, um, my mom like went on a hunt for like the Wii console when it first dropped. And one of the first games we got was Just Dance. So every Christmas morning we played Just Dance, like the whole family. <laughs> <laughs> Is it we'll still on the Wii or do you do it on like subsequent we do, we do it on the switch now oh okay i wasn't sure if you had like the christmas wii that you only bring out <laughs> oh, i you dust still it off have and... the wii i still have it and i actually use it for my run disney training sometimes i'm not gonna lie. So, <laughs> and um we're dancing my... with the 18s again <laughs> <laughs> you know gotta dance to some judas and some raspy you know yeah but um the other one is with my boyfriend's family they watch uh national National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation sure. um, every Christmas yeah. Eve. A classic. So classic. those are mine. There you go. <laughs> Alonzo, finish us out. What do you got? Uh, well, so my parents were both born in Spain, and so we would do the thing what they that they do in Spain, which is like the big dinners on Christmas Eve. Um, and so I grew up doing that, and I still do it. Like I, I basically kind of like dragged uh, my husband into the tradition. And so, um, you know, when I was growing up, uh as a kid like there would be christmas dinner and then i would go to bed and everybody would go to midnight mass and when they came home they would wake me up and say santa came so literally at two o'clock in the morning <laughs> i'm like half awake <laughs> ripping you know packages open and then once I, which is yeah it was just that that was just what we did and then once i knew what was going on i would also go to midnight mass we'd come home we'd have a glass we'd, we'd have a glass of champagne and we'd open presents and the thing was by christmas day we were done <laughs> we had we'd, we'd 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 had the big dinner. We opened all the gifts. So Christmas Day just became like we went to the movies, or we would go hang out at other people's houses. And yeah, I was just telling somebody there was a stretch in my teenage years where like we just saw one bummer Oscar bait movie after another. It was like <laughs> it was like out of Africa, The Last Emperor, Hoffa, and finally one year I was like, "Fuck it, we're going to Dumb and Dumber." I can't. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. No more prestige. No. I more have prestige. one other. I have one other thing that I miss. Uh, that is a tradition, and it actually involves Alonzo. Dave and Alonzo have had over the years the best Christmas Eve party uh, of my life. And, oh, thank and, you. And chosen family is extremely important to me. And and you know, but but what's great is you go to Alonzo and Dave's parties, and you know you're standing next to Manola Dargis, the critic for the New York Times, <laughs> and Rena Owen from Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones, and Once Were Warriors. It's the most eclectic group of like. <laughs> film aesthetes and actors and comedians and writers and then weird theme park people like me like it was the best sort of conversation party 
I I ever go to every year, and we haven't been for three years because of COVID. So mm. um, hopefully that comes back. It was yeah. Uh, we're it, going we're going to Atlanta this year because I haven't spent Christmas with my family in ages, even before the pandemic, just because yeah. it, it was a thing where we would always do it here. So, uh, but yes, twenty twenty three Christmas Eve is back on. Cobb. Los Angeles okay. hottest club for Christmas <laughs> <laughs> has everything. <laughs> has everything. So uh, as we finish up here, we have uh, two letters from the mailbag. I'm going to read real quick, both from Joe's or hello Joe. Joser, it's good oh, to hear hi, from Joser. you. Yay. Uh, he talks about, um, we talked about a, the attraction assignment. So them having videos of going to CMs and being like, you're in drawn and whatever. And then being like, yay. And he makes a good yeah, point here because we kind of poo-pooed it and said, well, like they don't get a raise or anything. Why does it matter? And, <laughs> and he makes a good point that his understanding is that these uh, stops to surprise uh, announce CMs um, are because uh, the CMs put in for transfers. So that to makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So oh. if they wanted it, it makes sense that, uh, again, yeah. I think, you know, it's Disney making also pay, Also, please pay them more. That yeah, was, yeah. That's just a comma. I mean, I that's nice. would prefer a raise. But. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a better reaction. But, but point taken, they were excited to go work in Galaxy's Edge or Tron or whatever. So let them have it. Okay. Yeah. Good. And yeah. then he talks about Doctor Who uh, and and its relationship yeah. with Disney Plus now coming up. And he says, as a fan of Who since 1982, I was pleasantly surprised at the production cost distribution partnership announced. While I would love some presence of the IP, from what I understand, that isn't covered by the agreements. Oh, like in the been. parks. Aww, you mean. I would there. highly desire a TARDIS uh, somewhere in the UK pavilion. I believe there may be a trademark thing at play, though, where the BBC would need yeah. to license it, which should make sense because they that did a huge sense. thing in Cardiff for years and years, and yeah, it's an probably all tied yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. who knows? But I my my fingers are still crossed, um, and that would be my Christmas wish. Maybe some some uh, Doctor Who at Disney. But anyway, to wrap up here, Alonzo, where can people find you? And 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 knowing your work, it's a lot of places. So everyone sit <laughs> back. Uh, you've been on CNN recently. You've got podcasts. You've got books. Tell us. Tell us all the good things. Well, the short answer is as long as there's a Twitter, I'm at A Duralde, A-D-U-R-A-L-D-E, where I pretty much link to whatever's going on. But yeah, I'm the film reviews editor at The Wrap, and you can read my reviews there. Um, I co-host the Linoleum Life podcast with my husband, Dave White. We've been doing it for 12 years. I also co-host the Breakfast All Day, Maximum Film, and occasionally Deck the Hallmark podcast. So you can give those a listen. Uh, and yeah, check out my my Christmas books again. I have yourself a movie, Little Christmas, and I'll be home for for Christmas movies and uh speaking of uh park uh uh cast not being paid well enough if you haven't checked out Abigail Dizzy's documentary The American Dream and Other Fairy oh, Tales yeah. it is currently streaming yeah it's great it's fantastic yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, gang, Rat Castle is produced by yours truly, Nathan Hartman. Please consider subscribing. That is our Christmas desire. Uh, so please do that if you haven't already and leave us a, a little five star review in Apple. We always love that or wherever you listen to us. You can check out more about what we're up to at ratcastlepodcast.podbean.com. But you can find all our links, including merch that you can put under your Christmas tree at bit.ly forward slash ratcastle. And with that, Merry Christmas to you all. So, you know, grab your belongings and exit to the left. <laughs> <laughs>